Hello. My name is Dave. Nice to meet you. That's DuPont and Ladybird. Hey, what are you guys barking at? This is a Premiere tutorial. I'm going to be teaching Premiere by way of a bunch of keyboard shortcuts. It's a completely redesigned keyboard. I made this keyboard shortcut layout in 2005. I had been an editor for several years before that in tape to tape rooms. And when I first started using Final Cut, I saw the keyboard shortcuts were all over the place. They didn't make any sense. So I made this layout and you'll notice they're all on the left hand side. That's so your left hand can rest right on the home row here and your right hand never has to come off the mouse. And this is really geared for people who know how to type. And uh, if you're going to be an editor, you really should know how to type. And if you don't know how to type, I really recommend that you learn. It's going to make things go a lot faster. Once you don't have to think about what you're doing with the interface and your fingers can just fly over it without you having to look down and see what you're doing, you'll have a better creative process. I'm going to start off really simple. So if you've used Premiere before, it's going to seem kind of basic. The first thing I'm going to do is show you where to put the keyboard shortcut file that you've downloaded. And there are instructions on where to download the file. There's also instructions where to download these images plus the list version of the shortcuts. Premiere doesn't really have a quick and easy way to import keyboard shortcuts like Final Cut and Avid and DaVinci Resolve do. You have to put the shortcut file into the right folder. And the easiest way to find what folder to put it into on your computer is to create a keyboard shortcut. Go to Keyboard Shortcuts. It should just default to Adobe Premiere Pro default, but save something under a name that you can search for. Uh, something unique. I'm going to choose Snoit. All right, so now I'm going to search for Snoit. And since I'm on a Mac, I'm going to use Spotlight, Command Spacebar, search for Snoit. There it is. Show all in Finder. Select that, and now you can see the pathway, and that's the folder where the keyboard shortcuts live. So what I'm going to do is copy this from here and put it into there. All right, so now I can go back to Premiere and go to Keyboard Shortcuts and select Dave's Keyboard Shortcuts. Now this should look similar to the image that you can download, except for all these on the right hand side. And the beauty is you don't need those really. You could ignore just about every one of these because everything you need to know and everything you need to use is over here. So the first thing I'm going to do is quickly go over each one of these. Just because it's a little intimidating at first to see all these things here, you'll see that uh, it's really simple and the layout is really intuitive. So I'm just going to quickly go over these and then you can see how they're used in practice. Okay, add marker. This is a quick way of leaving a little note on a clip or on the timeline. It can be used for logging footage. These are quick ways of increasing and lowering the volume 1 dB. And copy and paste, just the same as Command C, Command V, or Control C, Control V. And it's just easier to have them up here. And if you switch between a Mac and a PC, you don't have to switch between hitting Control C or Command C. It's always going to be the same. And paste attributes. After you hit copy on a clip, you can hit paste attributes, and you can paste one or all of the attributes of that clip onto another clip. So that can be size, rotation, volume, the color correction. Q, overwrite. This will be the main key you use to make an edit, to drop the footage down from the source window into the timeline. Ripple delete. This will get rid of footage between an in and an out point on the timeline and then close up that gap that you make. Go to previous and go to next edit are quick ways of navigating through a timeline. In fact, those are the keys I'm hitting right now. I'm hitting E and R to quickly go between clips these clips right here. Uh, zoom to sequence fits all the clips on your timeline in your timeline window so you can see everything. Mark clip is a quick way of putting an in point and an out point on a clip. Mark in and mark out puts a mark in and mark out on your source clip or on the timeline. Step back and forward one frame. Just go one frame at a time either on your source clip or on your timeline. G match frame It'll bring up whatever clip is on your timeline into the source window onto the same frame that you're resting on. And that'll all make sense when I show you this in practice. Reveal and Project will reveal whatever clip that your playhead is sitting on in the timeline amongst all the clips you have in your media pool. And Z Selection Tool, this is a way of getting back to this arrow selection tool. 
So if you're on a trim tool or something like a razor blade tool, hitting Z gets you back to this arrow. Shuttle left and shuttle right are your transport keys. If you hit X once, you'll go backwards at normal speed. If you hit it again, you'll go faster. Hit it again, you'll go faster backwards. And same with C. You hit it once, you'll go forwards regular speed. Hit it again, even faster. Hit it again, even faster. And I should mention that uh, spacebar is always play on every NLE. It's just the way the universe is created. That's the way it always will be. Hit spacebar once is play. Hit it again is stop. V, rolling edit tool, is one of the trim tools. I'll show you how that works. And B, add edit. This will split a clip. It's the same as selecting the razor blade tool and clicking on a clip except this does it with just one press of a key. You put the playhead where you want to make an edit and hit B. And N turns snapping on and off. Now these are the shift version of the keys, and I'm going to alternate back and forth between the lower and uppercase so you can kind of see how these are intuitively laid out. Okay, so the accent mark is add marker, shift is clear selected marker, shift one and two goes to previous marker or goes to the next marker, three and four copy paste, shift three and four undo and redo. And this is just like Command Z or Control Z, except they're up here. Q, overwrite, the main way of making an edit. And Shift Q, insert, another way of making an edit. And you'll see the difference between those two. W, ripple delete, clears between in and out and closes the hole. Shift W, clear, clears between an in and an out, but leaves the hole there. E and R, go to previous and go to next edit. Shift E, Shift R, zoom in, zoom out of the timeline. And Shift-T is clear in and out. Shift-Y is how you change the speed of a clip if you want it to go fast motion or slow motion. A, mark in. Shift-A, clear mark in. S, back one frame. Shift-S, go to the in. D, step forward one frame. Shift-D, go to the out. F, mark out. Shift-F, clear mark out. And G, match frame. Shift-G, reverse match frame. That'll make sense in a moment. X, shuttle left. Shift X, track selection back tool. So if you click on Shift X and you get the track selection back tool, anywhere you click on the timeline, it'll select all the clips from that point backwards. C, shuttle right. Shift C, track select forwards. That tool does the same thing, but selects all the clips forward from where you click. V, rolling edit tool. Shift V, slip tool. These are two trim tools that are very useful. And... Shift B, render in to out. This will render between an in and an out point. And Shift N is add frame hold. This is how you create a freeze frame. So now I'll kind of show you how these are used in practice. And I'll also show you how I like to set up my workspace here. First, I would um, get rid of things down here I don't need. So media, close, libraries, close, info, close, history, close. I, I really just use the undo and redo. These are the three windows I really use a lot. Then I want to customize this window because there are things here that I want to see, but I don't want to have to go searching for them. So I'm just going to make this bigger just for now. Frame rate is one of the things I want to see. Actually, I'm going to import some footage so you can see how these work a little better. There's a few links on where to get some footage. You could either use your own footage or use the same footage I'm using. Uh, I'm going to right click here, create a new bin. I'm going to call this sailing footage and you know keep things neat so i'm going to import that footage i have it here in a folder called footage same thing here keep things neat here so i'm just going to take this footage and put it into the sailing footage folder oh also when you save a project i like to create a folder where the project goes because other folders will be created in here you'll have auto save you'll have your render files maybe your proxy files will go in here so it keeps things neat to put them all in one folder I also like to drag the main project folder down here so you can get to it real quick. Okay, so back to arranging this window the way I want it to look. Frame rate, that's something I want to see. Who is doing construction right when I'm doing this? Oh my God, that's so annoying. Just ignore that. Uh, something else I want to see here is the video info. So I want to see at a glance what kind of video I'm working with. Right now it's all 1920 by 1080. You might have 2K footage or a 4K footage or SD footage. And then I like to use one of the little checkboxes. And you don't need this much space for a checkbox. And sometimes I'll click this if the footage is good. Sometimes I'll use this to indicate that I've used a shot. 
And one other thing I like to have is comments. And if you don't see something you're looking for up there, right click, click meta display, search for what you're looking for, check off comments. There it is. And that's about all I need to see. So if I move this back like this. So now if I need to find any of that, I could just kind of slide it over and take a quick peek without having to look for everything in here. And the comments are really going to save you. And by the way, if you're looking at your footage like this, I mean, this is fine if you have a few clips. You could just see at a glance what you have. But if you have 50 clips or 100 or 500 clips, you're just going to be scrolling through and looking for the right thumbnail. And it's not the best way to work. So, oh, by the way, you go back up through the file structure by clicking up here. So, the first thing you should do is log everything you have. You can't really start editing very well unless you've seen everything to begin with. And once it's all logged, not only can you search for it and find it, but it's fresh in your mind what you have because you've just gone through everything and logged it all. And it takes more time up front. It might take you a day or maybe two days to log everything, but it's going to be much less time during the edit. So really just think of logging your footage, really the first half of the editing process. A lot of editors just jump in and start working without ever logging anything, and they spend half their time searching for shots or not even knowing they have certain shots. So it's really worth that investment up front. Who is making this noise out there? Oh my God. I have to apologize for whoever is deciding to, I don't know what they're doing, cut down a tree? Okay, so once you have your window set up the way you like it, make sure to go here and say, save new workspace. I'm gonna call this one monitor. Hit okay, it already exists. I'm just gonna say replace it. Now I really recommend using two monitors. And if I was using two monitors, I would undock this. And then I would give myself much more room and probably some more room for comments. Now you could see a lot more at once and I would put that on the other monitor. And I would undock this, put that on the other monitor, undock this. And this is a very useful panel. I'll show you why in a bit. Put that on the other monitor. And these audio meters, they don't need to be that big. Just give yourself as much room for the timeline as you can. And you can scoot this down and make these bigger if you don't have a lot of tracks. But since I am using one monitor for the tutorial, I can go back up here. And it says I'm on one monitor still. So to get it back to how one monitor layout should look, you go to reset to saved layout. And before I start um, showing you the shortcuts, I'm going to just log this footage because that's really what you should do. So here, winch, that's Aaron and Watson sailing, boat passes bar, Boat passes people eating. And I'm going to show you another way of logging footage using the marker in a moment. But first, let's create a sequence. And there are several ways of creating a sequence. And you have to decide before you start your project what aspects you want your sequence to have and what footage you're using. So most of the time, you'll probably be working with a sequence where you'll want the same characteristics as the footage. But first, before I actually start doing some editing, I'm going to go over the keyboard shortcuts. And to do that, I want all these clips on the timeline. And the easiest way to do that is to drag them over there, lowercase t, zoom to sequence. So I'm going to first kind of go over the transport keys and the keys around the home row. And these are quick ways of getting around the timeline. So click on the timeline and you have lowercase r, go to next edit, r, 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 lowercase e, go to previous edit, r, e. R, E. Oh, and by the way, you can make these tracks bigger. I'm gonna make them nice and big so you can see what's going on here. And I'm going to lower all this volume because I know it's very loud uh, in the screen recording. And so to do that, that's two, nudge volume down one dB. You can also grab this line here and raise and lower the volume. You can see that's uh, just doing it on one clip. Uh, shift three, undo, two, Nudge volume down, nudge, 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 nudge. Okay. So where was I? Okay, R, E, 
C. C again. C again. Again. And again. Spacebar. Stop. X. X again. X again. X again. X again. Stop. Spacebar. Play. Spacebar. Stop. D. Forward one frame. S. Backward one frame. Shift E. Zoom in. Shift R. Zoom out. T. Zoom to sequence. R. E. Shift R. Shift E. T. Zoom to sequence. R. R. D. S. A. Mark in. F. Mark out. Shift S. Go to mark in. Shift D. Go to mark out. Shift A. Clear mark in. Shift F. Clear mark out. A. F. Shift S. Shift D. Shift A. Shift F. E. R. Y. Mark clip. Shift A. Shift F. Now let's say I want to mark this clip without using Y. I could do that by hitting E. A. R. Then I have to hit S to back up one frame. Because you can see if I hit F now for mark out, I would be catching one frame of the next clip. So S. F for mark out, and now my mark out just catches this clip. T, zoom to sequence, shift T, clear in and out. So I'll do that again to mark this clip right here. E, A, R, S, F. Go to in, shift S, go to out, shift D, shift T. So that's the basic of the transport keys. And you can see you can very easily get to all of that with your left hand resting right on the home row there. Now I'm just gonna kinda go from the very top and go over each one of these um, from the accent mark next to the one add marker okay so click on the timeline hit that accent mark and it leaves a marker right up there and you can see it up there because this is a representation of the timeline by the way that's the source window hit that key again and it lets you give some details for the marker name and comments I usually just use the name so it could be some kind of note like Footage to dark. Go over here, accent mark, hit it again, change this, right? Some kind of notes over here, accent mark, hit again. Man looks bored. So shift one, previous marker, shift one, shift two, shift two, shift accent mark, clear marker, shift one, shift accent mark. Shift three, undo, shift three, undo. Now there's another way to leave a marker and that's to select the clip. So if I go in here with the clip selected, accent mark, there's the marker right there. And if I call up this clip, match frame, I'll show you that in a second. There's the marker on the clip. Hit the add marker key again, accent mark. Watson looks at whale. Oh, I add another marker right here. Hit it again. There's the marker there. Watson looks at whales. That makes more sense. Did I spell whale wrong? I did. So these are the two markers on the clip up here and down here. And these are the three markers on the timeline up here and over here. And you could see these markers at a glance by going to the markers window. If I select the timeline, those are the three markers on the timeline. If I select the clip, those are the two markers on the clip. And if I click on it, it goes right there. I can also search here. So if I have hundreds of markers on a clip, you could search for that marker. So this is another way that I log clips. So if the clip has more than one thing going on in it, and it's too much to write down in the comment field, I'll use markers. So maybe right here is Aaron M. Watson sailing. But over here, hit the key, hit it again. Maybe the clip has changed and it's Aaron and Watson, I don't know, bathing. And then over here, it's Aaron and Watson eating. Okay, so now when you go to the markers field, let's say this clip is half an hour long and I've got 45 markers on it, I can go search for what I'm looking for bathing and there it is you click on it and you go right to it same with the timeline maybe I have a lot of notes on the timeline I could go search for something I could look for board there it is click on it goes right to it all right 
So I've shown you markers. I've shown you volume up and down wherever your playhead is rested. If I hit one, it goes up, two down. Or if I select a couple things, those go up and down. And this is just a quick way, if you're leveling out audio and you're working, oh, just a little too loud here, and you're going along, oh, a little too soft. There are other ways of working with audio. This is just a quick little way of doing it. Copy and paste. Well, here's three. Here's four. This purple line here is indicating that there are repeat frames. And if you have repeat frames, but it's not giving you a line like that, go up to this little wrenchy thing and make sure that show duplicate frames is on. There it's off. There are other things you can do up here, like not see the audio waveforms. You can see video thumbnails if you want. I don't find that useful. I do find the waveform useful. Okay, so here, select that, three, go over here, four, paste. What about paste attributes? Well, let's give this clip some attributes. Let's change the rotation and the scale. I'm going to go up here to effect controls. And if this is not twirled down, make sure you twirl this down. Now you can change the position, scale, rotation. I'll make this 150 uh, and the rotation uh, like that. And now let's say I want to have that same size and scaling on this clip. Well, if you hit three for copy, go over here, hit five, paste attributes. And it's asking you what attributes do you want to paste? I do want to paste the motion, so that's good. There's size and rotation. I'm going to hit Shift-3, undo. Let's say I also wanted to copy the volume on this. I'm just going to raise it up like that. And now I'll select both of these and hit 3 to copy. Now when I go over here, select both of these, hit 5. Now it's giving me the option to paste the volume attributes. I've got the rotation, the scaling, and the volume is matching. So this is a quick way if you need to make a sizing change and a volume change on a lot of clips. You can three copy and just paste it on everything you need to paste it on all at once. Now everything matches. I'm going to go over the match frame and reverse match frame key. So let's say I want to find this clip and bring it up into the source window because maybe I want to use something else on the clip or use another part of this clip. Just hit G, match frame. It matches this frame that you're on with the frame of that clip and brings it into the source window. So now I can do whatever I want with this clip, maybe do an in and out there, put it somewhere else in the timeline. Go over here, match frame. So it's calling up this clip in the source window. Match frame. Uh, I'm going to skip over to reveal in project. I'm going to go over here to the project window. Let's say I want to find this clip amongst all the clips in my media pool. There might be hundreds. That's just H. Reveal in project. There it is. Revealed it. That's this clip. If I double click on it, you can see that's that clip. So that's match frame and reveal in project. So I'll now show you reverse match frame, which I don't use nearly as often as match frame. Let's say I want to find where this frame lives in the timeline, or if it actually is in the timeline at all. Shift G, reverse match frame. It found it right there. Where's this frame in the timeline? Shift G, found it right there. Uh, call up this clip. Where does this frame live in the timeline? Shift G, right there. And so if the frame was not in the timeline, and you hit shift G, nothing would happen. So that's a way of seeing, am I using this shot anywhere in the timeline? Maybe the timeline is very long and I don't even know where this shot exists or did I use it at all? Shift G, well, there it is. So that's G, shift G and H. Let's go over ripple, delete and clear. I'm just gonna reset this footage the way it was before. Effects control. I'm gonna hit this reset effect. Let's say I wanted to get rid of segment of this clip from here to there and I wanted to close up this hole and just scoot everything down that's W uh, just something to watch out for if you have an in and an out and something else is selected and you hit W it's not gonna work right undo just make sure nothing else is selected W closes the hole shift 3 undo let's say I want to get rid of the footage between here and here but I want to leave that hole open and not move everything down Shift W. So that's the difference between ripple delete W and clear shift W. So let's say I want to get rid of these two clips. Uh, I would hit E 
twice. A. Click here. R. S. F. Now I have the selection marked. W. Gets rid of them and closes the hole. Shift W. Uh, w. Ripple delete is extremely useful. Sometimes I'll lay down a voiceover and you're playing along and it says, uh. Do spacebar. Back up. Hone in with an S and D. Mark in. And you could look on the waveform. You could see where that little uh is. Mark out. And then this W. You'll be playing along near voiceover. Oop, there's another little thing I need to close up. S back up. D forwards. W. Playing along. Oh, another one. A. F. W. So you can see how that's a very useful way of working, where you have everything on the timeline and you're just kind of closing up holes as you go along. Now I'll show you the most common way of editing using the Q and the Shift-Q buttons. So I'm just going to get rid of everything on here now. T, zoom to sequence. I'm going to select all and just get rid of all that. First thing I want to do is lay some shots down. So let's say I start here. And when you're editing like this with overwrite and insert, it works on the principle of three-point editing, which means you'll need an in and an out and an in or an in and an in and an out. And I'll show you the difference between these two ways of working. When I'm just building stuff on a timeline, let's say I'm editing the music, I'll select an endpoint, like uh, right where he's turning his head. Sorry, that's so loud. And then I'll take, I'll use a, an approximate out point. And the reason I use an approximate out point, because if you don't hit an out point, it's going to take the entire clip from this in point all the way down. And it's just going to take up a lot of space on the timeline and I'll have to zoom out a lot. So I'll just hit an approximate out, put an endpoint at the beginning here. Also, if you don't do an endpoint, it'll default to wherever your playhead is being the endpoint. And then you hit Q, overwrite edit. E, zoom in. I'm going to lower this audio. And so that took from here to here and put it down here. And then I'll usually just kind of play what I put down and listen to the, maybe it's to the music, maybe it's to a voiceover. And I'll see, ah, I want to do the next clip here. That's where the beat is or where the next thing on the voiceover starts. A, mark in. Go to my next clip or maybe it's somewhere else on this clip. In this case, I'm going to go to another clip and say I want to start right around here. S to frame back to hone in on that spot. A, mark in. And then an approximate mark out. F. And then Q is going to overwrite. So it's going to drop this clip down from here to here over this clip. Overwriting. And there it went. Click on the timeline, shift R, zoom out. And then I'll just kind of play what I've put down, see if this edit happens right where I want it to. Okay, let's say it does in this case. And then, oh, this is where I want the next thing to start. A, and then I'll go to another clip. I'll show you what happens if I don't do an approximate mark out. That was just shift F, clear mark out. Q, overwrite. See, it's just too much, and now it pushed everything down the timeline. Now I need to zoom to zoom out to see what I'm doing. And this clip could be really long. And then you just really need to zoom out. So it's, I'm gonna hit undo, zoom in, go back up here, do an approximate mark out. And if I do it too short, no problem. I'll do a Q, it's gonna overwrite there. Oop, I didn't do it long enough. I'm gonna select both of these and just drag. Um, by the way, I'm working in unlinked mode, which is this button right here. So I can do this. And I can do that. And this is the mode I like to work in. There are times when you really should work in linked mode. And if you're in linked mode, dragging one drags both. I'll show you when you need to be in linked mode. Oh, oh and snapping. in, snapping on and off. You could see this little magnet. When it's blue, snapping is on. So I usually work with snapping off. So I could grab this and I could position it anywhere I want. But if you do want it to be somewhere very specific like that. Hit N for snapping. Now I'll show you Shift Q insert. So let's say I want a shot of a winch between these two shots. So I want to insert a shot. So these clips are going to end up scooting down. So the length of my timeline is going to change. And I, let's say I want exactly from here to right here of the winch. I want exactly that much and I want it to be right there. Well, the first thing I'm going to do, click on the timeline, hit E, hit A for my insert point. 
And now you could see three point editing in, out, and in. Hit Shift Q for insert. Slid everything down. I'm going to hit undo. Shift Q. Inserts that winch footage and slides everything down. And it's this much of that winch footage that I'm inserting. I'm going to hit undo. Just to show you what overwrite would look like, instead of Shift Q, I'll hit Q. It overwrote that clip so the timeline did not become longer and it just wrote over with this footage. Hit undo. So Shift Q, insert, undo, Q, overwrite, undo. So that's in and out on the source and in on the timeline. Let's see what it looks like. We we'll go up here, Shift T, clear in and out. I'm just going to put an in point here and then an in and an out point here and do an insert. So that means I want the winch footage to start here, but I'm not determining how much winch footage is by putting an out up here. I'm determining how much it is by putting an out down here. So now I have in, in and out. Shift Q, slides everything over. Q, overwrite. Oh, by the way, if you want this to be put on video track two, patch it to two by moving this video one and patch it to track two. So I do a mark out here, Q, uh, and puts the audio down there. I'm gonna hit undo. Let's say I just want the video. Unpatch the audio. Q just puts the video track there, no audio. So there are two real reasons you would want footage on different tracks. One is organizational. So let's say you have an interview situation with B-roll. So the guy down here talking, that's the A-roll, uh, goes back to tape-to-tape -to -tape days. So that's on your A tape deck. And the thing that the guy's talking about, let's say he's talking about dogs, the dog footage would be on the B tape deck. So that's the B-roll. So while the guy is talking about dogs, you put the dog footage up here. And that's just a way to visualize what's going on. Here's the A-roll, here's the B-roll. Uh, it doesn't change how it will look in the end. For instance, I could move this down here. So I'm going to hit Shift to lock it in position and drag down. So here's the A-roll here, and that's the B-roll. In the end, the video is going to look exactly the same. But if you have it up here, you can just see at a glance where your B-roll is. Another reason you could use another track would be, let's say it's a two-person interview. So person A would be here, person B would be here. Just like before, if person B were down here, it would look the same in the end, but it's just a way of visually seeing what's going on. Uh, the other reason you have footage on two tracks is if you have maybe a graphic with an alpha that goes over footage, or if you have footage with a changed opacity, so you could see through it a little bit to the other track, or a transfer mode, like a screen mode or multiply mode or any of the kind of modes that you use in Photoshop. You can have all the tracks you want going all the way up with transfer modes, graphics on top of graphics. And that's the reason you have tracks above other tracks for a functional reason, not just for an organizational reason. Add edit. So there are a couple reasons you would use add edit. Let's say I want to get rid of footage from here on. If I hit B, adds an edit, and I could select that and get rid of it. I'm going to zoom in, shift E. You could see there's like a little bow tie symbol here. That's indicating there's what is called a through edit, meaning it's all part of the same clip. And if you don't see a little bow tie there, go to your wrenchy thing and make sure show through edits is clicked. And it's useful to have it clicked because if you don't, it just looks like any other edit. So you might be adding an edit like I did and not moving the footage or not deleting the footage and just keeping it right here. And to see that through edit is useful. And the reason you would add an edit and not move or delete the footage would be maybe you want to add a different size right here. So maybe this is a, an interview situation and you have an HD timeline and you're using 4K footage. And so your 4K footage over here is shrunk down 50%. And then over here, you make it 100%. So it looks like a separate camera angle uh, during an interview. So that's a reason you might add an edit, or maybe you change the color correction there, or you might change the speed here. Oh, and uh, here's something you should know. I forgot to mention the first time around, so I'm putting it in right now. If you want to get rid of a through edit, right click on it and click on join through edits. And now it's gone. No more through edit. I haven't talked about the speed shortcut. I'm going to get rid of that. Go here, click on this, hit Shift Y, bring up the speed dialog box. Let's say I want it to be 50%. If I don't click on the ripple shift trailing clips, watch what happens. This footage is now 
slow motion. It says 50% right here. You could tell there's an effect on it because this FX symbol is there in yellow. I'm going to hit undo. So I'm going to now do shift Y, 50%, and check the ripple edit box. And you'll see how that looks different. Now the entire clip is there, 50%, which means in this case it's twice as long, and it pushed everything down. Hit undo, shift Y, don't ripple, 50%, didn't shift everything down. So you can tell this would be a very useful way of changing the speed of a clip, but not changing the length of your timeline. All right, now one of the only things left are the trim tools. That's V and Shift V. So if I hit V, it gives you the trim tool. And by the way, hitting Z takes you back to the arrow tool. V, trim tool. Uh, it's got that slash through it because uh, it only works if you're right here or right here, right on the edit. And this is a way, let's say I want more of this clip and less of this one. So click right there and start to drag to the right. And you can see the outgoing and incoming frames of the two clips. So now I have more of this one and less of this one. Let's say I want to go the other way, drag to the left. Less of this one and more of this one. Drag it over here, hit N for snapping. Snapped right back to that audio point. Let's say I want the audio and video to drag at the same time. Select this link selection. Now when I drag, they're both going. That can be very useful. Okay, so that was V, Rolling Edit Tool. Next I'll show you Shift V, the Slip Tool. Shift V, it looks like this and it works in the middle of the clip here. And it's a way of moving around footage within the confines of an edit. So let's say I wanted this winch footage to be in here, but I wanted it to start earlier or later. Let's say instead of starting there, I want it to start there. The quick way of doing this would be Shift V, and now I'm going to slide backwards, and you could see the clip is starting later and later. Seems a little confusing, but once you do it a few times, it'll make complete sense. But what I'm really doing is kind of sliding that entire winch clip within the confines of this edit. So as I go back, it's starting later and later. So now I wanted it to start right there. So now it starts later. Undo. Let me do that again. Shift V, move backwards. You can see the in and the out frames and they change as I move, moving back. Now that clip starts just a little later. Let's say I want it to start one frame later. Shift V, move back. You could see the numbers down here. One frame, two frames, minus. Go this way, one frame, two frame, plus. Just a quick way of making a little adjustment. And because my linked selection button is clicked, the audio moved with the video. If I unclick this linked selection, you'll see what happens. Shift V, moving it, and you'll see this little minus six there, plus six there. That means the audio and the video are out of sync by six frames. I'll hit undo. So when you're using the slip tool, make sure you got your video and the audio linked, unless there's some reason you don't want them to be. If I wanted to do this without the slip tool, the long way and start this winch footage later. The way I would do that would be Y mark clip, E go to previous edit, G match frame, go up here, start this footage a little later, mark in. I'm going to hit shift F for clear mark out and then Q overwrite. I'll lower this audio. Now I've just started that edit a little bit later, but it was much easier just to hit shift V and do this, or do this. Z, back to regular arrow. Shift C, track select forward tool. Anywhere I click, will select all the tracks from that point on. Shift X, track select backwards tool, will select every clip from this point backwards. So I'll go back to Z. So let's say I want to move everything from this point on and kind of make a hole, slide everything down, because I want to put something in there. I could go like this, but let's say there are 150 clips I might be doing this for quite a while. T zoom to sequence. Much easier just to do track select forward. Click, hold down that left mouse button, and just move. Now I've opened up a hole, and I've made sure that I've moved every clip over that way. If you went like this, you might miss some audio tracks down here or video tracks up here by not selecting high enough or low enough. Let's say I wanted to paste a bunch of stuff between here and here. 
Maybe I got it from another timeline. I'm just going to use this for an example. Three for copy. Shift C, select all tracks forwards. Scoot everything forwards. Z, selection tool. E, go to previous edit. Four, paste, not enough room, oops. Shift three, undo, shift C. Track select forward, click, move. Shift R, zoom out. Click and move it some more. Z, selection tool, four, paste. Okay, so now I wanna close this hole up two ways. Shift C, track select forward and move it over with the snapping on, hit undo, or Z, selection tool, A, mark in, R, S, back up one frame, F, mark out, W, ripple delete. All right, let's say I wanna create a freeze frame. Let's say I want the winch to stop right there and just freeze right there. So wherever your playhead is, that's where it's gonna add a hold. So select the clip, shift N, create it in edit, and now this is the frame hold. So it goes up to there, frame hold, and you can make this as long as you want. Well, let's say I want it to be that long. B, delete. Okay, so that's add frame hold. I'm gonna talk briefly about fit to fill. That's changing the speed of a clip to fit within an in and an out point. Premiere works a little different than Final Cut, where there's a fit to fill shortcut. Here, there's no fit to fill shortcut. You just use a mark in and mark out and a mark in and a mark out. In other words, you're not doing three point editing anymore. Hit Q. And so now it's confused. Do you want to change the clip speed, which is fit to fill, or all these other options? Uh, here I'll just say change the speed. Hit OK. I'll zoom in. The speed is 1416.67%. It had to make it a lot faster to fit. Uh, hey there. I just watched that fit to fill segment and I think it kind of sucked a little. So I just want to clarify things. Um, let's say I want to fill this gap here with footage of Aaron Watson on the sailboat, let's say. Well, I could mark this clip, Y, or another way I can mark it is E, A, R, S, F, Shift T, clear in and out, do that again. E previous, A mark in, R next edit, S back up one frame, F mark out. All right, so we we'll wanna fill this gap with the sailing footage. I'll go up here and hit mark in. Now I have my three point editing, mark in, mark in, mark out. Q, overwrite. And here I've filled that gap. But let's say for some reason I need to have this gap filled with just this turn of Watson. And I need to have Watson's turn end right there, but I need to have this footage fill the gap. That means it's gonna have to be slow motion a bit. But exactly how much slow motion does this need to be? Well, I can make some kind of guess, and you know, maybe it's a uh, 60%. I'm gonna not click ripple because I don't want it to shift everything down. And just play this here. So it's not quite slow enough, and you could keep guessing until it's perfect, but there's an easier way of doing this and getting it exact by using fit to fill. So I'm just gonna get rid of that. I'm gonna use mark clip to select this gap, Y. And if you look over here, four seconds, that's the length of this in to out area. And it'll go over here. I have a mark in where I want that turn to start. I want it to end right there. Happens to be exactly two seconds. And so now I have mark in, mark out, mark in, mark out. So if I do Q for overwrite, it doesn't know do I want the mark out to be there at two seconds or do I want it to be here at four seconds? I'm giving it too many options. And the way Premiere works is, here I'll hit Q, it asks me, what do I wanna do? Do I wanna change the clip speed to make it fit to fill? Do I want to ignore the source in point? Do I want to ignore the source out point? So I really don't like the way Premiere does this. Final Cut and Avid just automatically ignore one of these out points and then fit to fill is a shortcut. But once you get used to Premiere's way, it's not so bad. I'm gonna change this to change clip speed fit to fill. And you could check this box here, always use this choice. But I don't like to check that because if I'm not paying attention and I accidentally leave an out point on my source window, I don't wanna hit Q and have it just do a fit to fill automatically without me 
specifying. So now if I hit OK, it changed the speed to 50% because this is two seconds needing to fit in a four second gap. So now it fits perfectly in there. I'm going to delete this. Y mark clip. I'm going to go here. Shift S, go to in. I'm going to hit plus eight. So that put an eight seconds right in there. Hit enter. Hit mark out. The length I've selected is eight seconds in one frame. I'm just going to back up one frame. S, F, mark out. Now it's exactly an eight second duration between my mark in and mark out. And this down here is exactly four seconds between mark in and mark out. So hit Q, overwrite. I'm going to select change clip speed, fit to fill, hit OK. Now it changed the clip speed to 200%. So it has to go twice as fast to fit this eight seconds into a four second gap. So fit to fill is useful in some situations. Be careful you don't use it if it's where fast or slow motion would look funny. For instance, someone talking. So here, just a word on different ways Premiere handles speed changes. Shift Y, bring up the speed dialog box. So there are different time interpolation methods and it defaults to frame sampling. And so this is mostly important during slow motion. Let's say it's 20%. Frame sampling can result in some stuttering movement like that, shift Y. Frame blending can sometimes be a little smoother. And what it's really doing is these tiny little dissolves between each frame. And that's resulting in a red line here. This needs to be rendered. So I'll do Y, mark clip, shift B, render in and out. And I'll talk about rendering in more detail a bit later. Let me play this. So it's a little smoother, but you could see these little ghosting areas. Those are the little dissolves. So there's one other method you can use, shift Y, optical flow. And this is the smoothest method. And what it's doing is kind of these little morphs between each frame. And that can take a long time to render. And you can also get these strange artifacts in the morphing uh, if there's a lot of movement going on in your clip. So if you use optical flow, make sure you check to make sure there's nothing strange going on. I'm gonna hit Shift B, render into out. See, this is taking much longer than frame blend. Let's play this. Very smooth and no weird artifacts. Okay, so that's fit to fill and some speed change options. Now on to the rest of the tutorial. So let's take a look. We added markers, cleared markers, went to a previous and went to next marker, nudge volume up and down, copy and paste, undo and redo, and paste attributes, cue overwrite footage, insert footage, ripple delete, close the hole, clear, delete and leave the hole, go to previous edit, next edit, zoom in and zoom out of timeline. Zoom to sequence, make everything fit in the timeline, and clear in and out points. Mark the clip, put an in and an out on the clip, beginning and end. Change the speed of a clip, do a mark in on a clip, clear that mark in. Step back one frame, go to the end point, step forward one frame, go to the out point, mark out, clear that mark out, match frame, find a frame that's on the timeline in the source window, reverse match frame, find a frame that's in the source window on the timeline. Reveal in project, find a clip that's in the timeline in your media pool. Z, go back to the selection tool, shuttle left and shuttle right, track select backwards and track select forwards. The rolling edit tool works on the edit point. Slip tool, slips the footage within the confines of an edit. Add edit, splits a clip. We'll go over rendering and snap and frame hold makes a freeze frame. All right. so. I'm just gonna go a little bit into transitions. So let's say I want to have a dissolve between this clip and this clip. I'm gonna unclick link selection. Let's say I want to dissolve between there and there. Right click on the edit. I'm gonna say apply default transition. And that's applying a dissolve. You could see how long this dissolve is by double clicking on it. It's 12 frames. You could change how long it is there, two seconds. You could change how long it is here. You can move it around so it starts there or it starts there or it starts anywhere in between, or is shorter. Does a little dissolve there. Let's say you want a crossfade of the audio. 
I'm going to right click down here, apply default transition. And this is five frames. I like to use a little five frame crossfade. It smooths out your video resolves. Also, if you're doing audio edits, you might get a little pop. A little crossfade goes a long way. So I have it defaulted to five frames for my audio crossfade and 12 frames for my video crossfade. The place you do that is up here, preferences, timeline, and here, video transition default duration, 12 frames. And audio transition default duration, 5 frames. Make sure you, this says frames because this defaults to being seconds. So when you put 5 there and you don't look, it's 5 seconds. So now I'm going to export this. Uh, make sure there are no in and out points. Because if you have an in and out point set, it's going to only export between those two. Some editors think you need to do an in and an out point on the entire timeline. It's not necessary. Shift T, clear in and out. If there are no in and out points, it's just going to output the entire timeline. So I just, as a general rule, Shift T, clear in and out. Command M goes to the export window, which is just up on here. Export, media, Command M. So Command M. I usually use H.264 if I'm going to export for YouTube or Vimeo. Usually defaults to match source high bit rate, which is this down here, 10. 12 and this is the estimated size 19 megabytes if it's way too big and you have a very long timeline you can make this lower like six let's say and eight now the estimated size is 11 megabytes if you make these too small you're going to start getting some funky looking things uh, could go back up here to the match source high bit rate i'll take it back to 10 and 12. Tell this where to go, give it a name. Tutorial two in my, there's my shortcut, roughs folder. So that's the name and where it's going. There's the path and then hit export. So I'm gonna talk about rendering. Um, this red line indicates this needs a lot of rendering. If there's no line, no rendering is needed. And depending on what you're doing, you might need a lot of rendering. Let's say you're using 4K footage with a lot of effects and sizing and color correction, and you're on an underpowered system, your entire timeline might be red. And by the way, these things that say full, one half, one fourth, one eighth, one sixteenth on the source side and here on the timeline side, if you're having trouble with playback, try selecting less than full resolution. This might help with playback. It's not gonna help with your rendering situation. So let's say I add something to this that requires this to be rendered, like uh, sphere rise. Okay, so that's completely red. I'm on a pretty underpowered system, so it's just gonna go red right away. So if I wanna render this, I'm going to Y mark clip, and I'm gonna hit Shift B, render in to out. And what that has done is created a preview clip, and it's put it in this folder, Adobe Premiere Pro Video Previews. And these are my preview clips. See, there's the one over the sphere. And it plays that clip instead of doing the calculations. It did the calculations when I hit render. I hope you got that. Uh, I'm going to go see what the dogs are doing. I don't know what they're doing. Thank you for watching. Ladybird! Hey! Ladybird, you want some cheese? Come on, pups. You want some cheese? Want a treat? Okay, I'm back. The dogs have calmed down a bit. And I thought I'd do a little editing on an actual project. And the project I'm going to edit is what you've already been watching, this tutorial. So I just exported the screen capture that I made that you have already watched. And I'm going to bring that in. So I'm going to make a bin here. Screen captures. Bring that in. Let's look at the characteristics of this 30 frames per second and 1728 by 1080, strange size. So in this case, when I make a sequence, I'm not going to take the characteristics of this footage because I want my sequence to be 1920 by 1080, not this weird 1728 by 1080. But I do want it to be 30 frames per second. So I'm going to go here to uh, this icon, new item, new sequence. I'll choose this 1080p, 30 frames per second. 
call it um, tutorial edit. Put it in the sequences folder. So that's 30 frames per second, 1920 by 1080, good. So now if I did drag this in like this, I would say keep existing settings. And so you can see the footage is a little smaller than the actual sequence, but I think that's all right. Another way you can make this edit, I'll just hit undo. You could just double click on it. And I know I'm gonna take this whole screen capture in and I'm gonna be just removing things as I go. So in this case, I'm not gonna be making mark-ins and mark-outs and selecting things up here and making edits. I know I want this whole thing. So I could just hit Q to drop this down. T, I'll make this bigger so you can see it. And if you take a look down here, you can see the way Camtasia captured my screen recording. It did it in a stereo track. And for some reason, the system audio is on the right-hand side. That's like me playing video in the window while I'm doing the screen capture. But it's also married to my narration up here on the left-hand side. So that means I can't separate the system audio from my narration, which is kind of annoying. But I do want this to be pan center. And one way you can pan track center is to click on your audio track, go to audio channels, do that. But you can see up here, this is grayed out. So I can't change it from stereo. And now everything's pan centered. I'm going to hit undo. Another way you can do this, if you want things to be pan centered and have the mono track or a couple mono tracks, you click on the actual clip over here, go to modify audio channels. And now this is not grayed out. I could say mono and I can make one mono track or I can make two. I'll show you what that looks like. And this is a little thing saying this is not going to affect the clip that's on the timeline. So I hit yes. That means I have to redrop that down. Q. All right, so now you see I have two mono tracks. And I can just get rid of the system audio. It's gone. Uh, although it's still married in here. And I'm going to lower this volume a bit just for the tutorial because I think it's a little loud on the screen capture. So two, 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 two. So let me just play this. Shift E, zoom in. Hey. Hello. My name is Dave. Shift E. That's uh, DuPont and Lady Bird. That's DuPont and Lady Bird. All right, so I say that twice, so I could see it on the waveform there. DuPont and Lady Bird, DuPont and Lady Bird. SS, A, mark in. Drag this over here. DD, kind of hone into the right spot. F, mark out. W, ripple delete. My name is Dave. That's, and I like to make a practice of just doing a little crossfade. If I'm doing an audio edit like this, sometimes there will be a tiny little click or a little change. So putting a little five frame cross dissolve just makes it a little smoother. You don't always have to have that, but sometimes you definitely do. That's DuPont and Lady Bird. That's a long pause there. So F mark out, A mark in, W ripple delete. Just a little crossfade. Nice to meet you. Hey. It's a little pop there. Hey, what are you guys barking at? Uh, DuPont is a white wolf of some kind. What? I don't know what she is. And DuPont is a Shih Tzu. I just said DuPont's a white wolf. No, Lady Bird's something. I don't know. I don't think she's a wolf, but she looks like something pointy-eared. But I messed up here. Uh, DuPont is a, I don't know what I was thinking, white wolf. Um, I think I'm just going to get rid of this completely. You don't need to know back then what kind of dogs they are, because I'm telling you now, or something. And DuPont is a Shih Tzu. Get rid of that, plus that breath. W. Anyway, this is... Okay, so I'm going to put an image of DuPont and Ladybird in here, and I'm going to animate them sliding in from left and right, and I'm going to use keyframes for that. And just about everything you do is keyframable, so that means you can animate what you're doing over time. So I'm going to bring in the images of DuPont and Ladybird. It's in my Photoshop folder. DuPont, Ladybird. Put them in the Photoshop folder. 
And you can see it defaults to bringing in a still image to five seconds. The way you change that is here, preferences, timeline, and you can change this to two frames. I had it on this setting when I brought in all the images for the for making the keyboard. So I can just lay these down on the timeline just by dragging them all at once, and they went down like that. So first thing I'll do is mark in where DuPont will be coming in. My name is Dave. That's DuPont. Okay. Mark in there. DuPont and Ladybird. DuPont and Ladybird. I'll see where I want him to go away. Nice to meet you. Hey, what are you guys barking at? Anyway, this is a two right about here. So I'll put DuPont down on track two. So I'm going to patch video one, which is this, to track two. Go up here, take out this mark out. So I just have mark in, mark in, mark out, hit Q, overwrite. I'll make this a little bigger. This went red because this is a very large photo and I'm on a very underpowered system. Now I'll put down the ladybird clip where she belongs. That's DuPont and right there, ladybird. And I want the ladybird clip to go away at the same time as the DuPont clip. So I'll just hit R, 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 S to back up one frame to the end of this clip, F mark out. There's ladybird. I'll put her on track three. So patch video one, which is that to track three, which is here. Shift F to take out that mark out point and Q, overwrite. That's DuPont and Ladybird. So I just need to resize these and reposition them and bring them in from the left and right side. So the easiest way to do something like that is to put things into the place where you want them to end up. So I'll do um, Ladybird first. I'll go up here to Effect Controls to Scale under Motion, and I'll do an approximate size. And let's see, I want her to end up maybe over there about. And now I'll resize DuPont to match that. Right about there. And I want DuPont to end up right about there. Uh, I think they can be a little bigger, so let me make DuPont maybe change that to 15. So that's where I want them to end up. So I'll put those ending keyframes in first. So DuPont's ending keyframe, go to the beginning of DuPont's clip, and maybe take 20 frames for it to slide in. So click anywhere on the timeline, click the plus button, two zero. Just that got me forward 20 frames. Click on the DuPont clip. And this is where I want the ending keyframe to be. So I'll click the stopwatch icon on position. That creates a keyframe. And that is 20 frames in from the beginning of the clip. And this is the playhead for the clip itself. So you can see it moving around on the clip. So that's 20 frames in. I'm going to put it at the beginning of the clip. And now I can make the first keyframe, which will be all the way off screen. And just changing the position creates a keyframe automatically. Make sure it's right at the very beginning there. So it created that keyframe that you could barely see right there. And now I'll play DuPont and Ladybird. So you could see, just looking at the DuPont clip, DuPont and Ladybird, when it stops, it stops abruptly. And you don't want that. You kind of want it to slow down before it stops. DuPont and Ladybird. So right click on this keyframe, go to Temporal Interpolation and Ease In. This will ease it into that keyframe. DuPont and Ladybird. See, much better. I'm not going to do an ease out on the first keyframe that's DuPont and Lady because that's easing it out from some place where you're not even seeing it so that doesn't really make sense so I'm gonna hit undo on that so it goes back to a regular looking keyframe there that's DuPont and Ladybird so I'll do the same thing with the Ladybird clip click on it E go to previous edit click on the timeline plus 20 that's 20 frames in from the beginning of the clip Right here, click on the position stopwatch, making a keyframe. Take it to the beginning of the clip by sliding this up here. See that slides it around the clip there. 
and slide it to where you want it to start. And it makes a keyframe automatically. Right click on this keyframe, temporal interpolation, ease in. Let's take a look. That's DuPont and Ladybird. So I think um, Ladybird clip was a little bit late coming in. DuPont and Ladybird. Yeah, so I'm gonna slide it over like this and then slide this over here. Click on the N to enable snapping. It snapped it there. Let's take a look now. That's DuPont and Ladybird. Okay, that's better. Hey, what are you guys barking at? Anyway, this is a tutorial, so I'm just gonna have them dissolve out. So right click up here, default transition, right click down there, default transition, which is 12 frames. Anyway, this is a tutorial. Uh, okay, that looks good. I'm gonna put a little drop shadow on each one. So let me start with DuPont. Go over here to the effects window, search for drop shadow, drop. There it is down there. Drag it over to the DuPont clip. And now up here, under effects controls, I can change the aspects of this drop shadow. So first thing I'll do is change the distance so I can see it. And this is a really large photo, so the distance is gonna be pretty large and it's gonna be slow to move out. And it's kinda acting funny. Um, the smarter thing would have been to take these both into Photoshop and resize this DuPont image so it was the same size as the Ladybird image. But um, never said I was smart. So now I can copy this drop shadow, three, click on the Ladybird clip and hit four. And what it's done, I'll turn it on and off, is it's copied it, but the characteristics are completely wrong for this. It's got way too much softness, way too much distance. I'll turn the softness all the way down and I'll turn up the opacity so you could see where it is. There it is. So too far out. All right, so this needs some serious rendering here. Shift B, render. Render, 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 render. Render, 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 render. Oh, I know. How about I do an ASMR video while I'm waiting for it to render? Oh, all this. Is that doing anything? That's just weird. Oh my god, it's rendering very, very slowly. Wow. Oh, that took forever. All right, let's let's play this thing. Miss Dave, that's Dupont and Ladybird. Nice to meet you. Hey, what are you guys barking at? Anyway, this is a tutorial. All right. So I'm just going to go over keyframing a little bit more. I'm going to choose a little piece of this to do that with. I'll make an edit here. B. And go down a little ways. Make another edit. And I want to zoom in to the footage, stay zoomed in for a little bit, and then zoom back out. So I'll go up here to the effect controls. I'll turn on the stopwatch on scale, which is going to enable keyframing and create the first keyframe. I'll move forward a few seconds, maybe two seconds. And I'll create another keyframe by making a size change, 200. So I want it to stay 200% for a while and then go back to 100%. So right about here, I'm going to make it go back to 100%. But I need to add a keyframe here to let it know I want it to stay 200% for this entire distance. And the way you add a keyframe if you're not going to change something is click on this dot right here. And then at the very end of this clip, I want it to be back at 100%, so put in 100 here. So it'll take two seconds to get to 200%, stay 200%, then a little bit longer, it looks like, than two seconds to get back to 100%. Anyway, this is a Premiere tutorial, and it's really geared for people who have never... So I'll just go forward a bit here. And if you are dragging from the source window to the timeline... Okay, so you can see that when it... Anyway, starts its move. This is a premiere tutorial. And stops its move. It's very abrupt. So I want to smooth that all out. So I'll do them one at a time. So in this one, I want it to ease out. And then I want it to ease in here. So it starts off nice and easy and ends up nice and easy. I want it to ease out of this one and ease in to that one. 
anyway, this is a premiere tube. So it kind of started slow, got faster, and then slowed down. Anyway, this is a premiere tutorial. Much smoother than it was before. And if you are dragging from Start the slow, window, it's faster, the timeline slows down. So that's really how keyframing works. And you could do that for rotation and on just about anything. I'll go to a color correction effect, video effects, color correction, Lumetri color. Hit E, go to previous edit, click on the clip. And click on the stopwatch here for shadows, midtones, and highlights. It added a keyframe right there. You can barely see it. I'll go into the clip a little bit, and then I'll make a change on something, which will add a keyframe automatically. Or maybe I'll raise this up. So you could see it made a keyframe there. And so <laughs> it's going to animate from where it is normally. Anyway, to this there. Is... And if I want to get rid of all the keyframes, click on the stopwatch. It says the keyframes will be deleted. And so it deleted them. Now I can reset this to back to normal. So I'm just going to keep working on this tutorial here. Oh, and by the way, I realize there's a giant watermark here. So you're welcome, Camtasia, for the advertising. But seriously, $249? Really? Okay, I'm going to go over audio a bit, very briefly, and then go over some color correction techniques. So you already know how to raise and lower the volume real quick with one and two. But there are a few other ways to deal with audio. One is you can go over to the effects window twirl down this audio effects, and drag one of these onto a clip. So here's an EQ, I could drag that down there. Go to the effects control window, there's that EQ. Click on edit, and you could change this EQ here. Another way you can deal with audio is to call up the audio track mixer. So I'll bring that up, and here you see all the tracks that I have. Track one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. And these are the panning knobs, and these are the audio levels. So you might bring in a stereo music track, and it comes in as two mono tracks instead of a stereo track like this. And when that happens, they're going to default to pan center. So when you play it, it's not going to sound like stereo anymore. So one way you can fix that would be to pan track one all the way left, and pan track two all the way right, and then it would sound like stereo again. Another very useful thing you can do in here is to twirl down this arrow, and that brings up the effects. And on each one of these tracks, you can call up an effect, or you can call it up on this track here, and this is your master track. It says master right there. So whatever you apply here will affect all your tracks. And I like to use this amplitude and compression multi-band compressor. That's what I'm using on this thing that you're listening to right now. And this does a great job of raising the audio up to a nice level without it going over and peaking. Let's say I also wanted to apply some reverb. You can go down to this space here, put on some reverb, and if you double click right there or right here, you get the settings for each one of these effects. I find the multi-band compressor effect works pretty good without changing anything. But here, double-click the reverb effect. You can change how much reverb, the room size. And if you want to remove that, just go to None. So if you just wanted reverb on track 1, you could do that here. Or on track 2. Or if you want it to apply to all your tracks, put it here. One thing you should keep in mind when you're using a compressor like this is that it raises all the little quiet sounds up also. So you have to make extra sure that your audio is very clean because in a voiceover, it's going to raise up all the little breaths and mouth sounds and little popping things that you might not have heard originally. So once you put that on, make sure to listen back and clean up all the little gross things that you might hear like that. All right, so that's enough on audio, I think, here. I'm going to talk about color correction. And I've applied color correction on a couple of these clips and uh, exported them and brought them back in. So they're right here. Needs color correction, needs color correction. And you can download those too and work along with me with the same clips. The first thing you should do when doing color correction is bring up scopes. So go up to Window, Lumetri Scopes, and it usually docks it right there. Uh, but I want to see these effects controls also, so I'm going to undock this. 
and I would normally bring this over to the other monitor but in this case I'll just kind of make it smaller and put it somewhere here and this comes up it might have several different kind of scopes on here but I'm just gonna use a couple of these so if you click on the wrenchy thing these are all the scope options you have and you can change some of the parameters of a couple of these so I'm gonna get rid of the vector scope for now and I'm gonna change the waveform type to Luma so on the left is the waveform and on the right is the parade and the type is RGB so make sure that's on RGB so right now I'm just gonna look at the waveform and I'm gonna go over here to this clip so the way this works is this represents the video showing the blacks and the whites so white should be at hundred black should be around zero there so you can see right away that the whites aren't reaching hundred so it's a little dark in the whites and the blacks are way above zero so it's a little washed out in the blacks so to fix this we'll put a Lumetri color effect on there so go to effects video effects color correction Lumetri color and drag that on there now there's a Lumetri color window but I don't really use this I'm gonna close it I just deal with it in the effects control window so click on the clip there it is Lumetri color so you could twirl down all these things to deal with them color wheels and match curves creative basic so in here are a lot of things you could change exposure you know the saturation and sharpness what I'm really going to deal with right now are the color wheels and these are what you use for just basic color correction so here you have shadows midtones and highlights and I'll show you how these affect the video so watch the video screen and this waveform on the left raise the shadows now the blacks aren't really black anymore and you can see the blacks are way up there here's highlights I'll bring that down now the whites and the highlights are getting darker now there's really no blacks and really no whites the midtones also called gamma work in the middle area when you change this it will affect highlights and the shadows a bit but mostly it's working here in the middle so these controls on the side globally change all the colors so it globally changes everything on the shadows on the midtones and the highlights if you click in the middle I can change the color of the highlights so here I'm bringing a lot of magenta into the whites undo here I'm bringing a lot of blue into the blacks okay so here's a lot of red into the blacks using a combination of these sliders and these things in the middle are how you would adjust to get a good contrast and good white balance so right now I'm not going to deal with white balance I'm just going to deal with getting a good contrast good amount of blacks and good amount of whites in the video so the first thing you do is adjust the shadows and then you do the highlights so I need to bring these down until this gets to zero now if I keep drawing this down it's going to get closer and closer to zero but it's also going to kind of bring all this detail down into the black so you'll lose fine detail in the blacks and that might be a look you're going for I'll show you what happens if you bring it down too much it's going closer to zero all right now they're starting to crush now I've got to zero I've crushed these blacks and I actually have a flat line right here that means I'm cutting off all detail on those blacks and that's called clipping and you really don't ever want to do that unless it's some extreme look you're going for so I'll raise this back up until I can see it comes off the zero stops being flat at the bottom still coming up off zero all right right about there and then for the whites come over here to highlights and raise this up until it gets to 100 so you can see here this is going right up to zero and you can see by clicking on the FX symbol before after before after and you can take this and hit copy go to another clip for paste so if you have to apply the same color correction to many different shots you can select a lot of them and apply it or if you wanted to copy some volume attributes 
plus sizing attributes, you would hit three copy, five paste attributes, the motion, the sizing, the rotation, the volume, click on that, and this Lumetri color or any other effects you might have on that clip. You could select one or all of them and apply that. So that's a quick way of fixing one clip and then applying it to all the other clips if they have the same issue. But a lot of times I'll just go to copy this Lumetri color effect, three, and go to another clip I want to work with, four. Even if it needs different things done to it, it's just a quick way of getting that Lumetri color effect on that clip so I don't have to go looking for it here and all the things are twirled down already that I want twirled down. And then I'll just go reset and start from scratch on this. So I'm gonna show you something a little bit more complicated, but it's pretty easy once you get the hang of it. And that's how to get a good white balance. So looking at this, you can see right away, look at the whites, they look a little reddish. Look at the blacks, they look very green. Also, the entire clip looks kind of washed out. The blacks aren't very black and the whites aren't very bright either. So look at the scopes and you can see all that going on. The blacks aren't very black. It's raised up from zero. The whites aren't very bright. It's way down from 100. And here you have your red, green, and blue channels. So the same thing, 100 and zero. The more you have in this direction, the more you have of that color. So here there's a lot more red up here than there is green and blue. So there's more red in the highlight area. And down here, there's a lot more green in the black area. So to fix that, go down to your color wheels. The first thing I'm gonna do is take care of this waveform black and white situation. So I'm gonna lower the shadows till it approaches zero, right about there. Raise the highlights so it gets close to 100 there. So now there's good contrast without clipping anything. You could still see fine detail here in these clouds. And there's still some detail on these blacks here. Now I'll use the controls inside of these wheels to take care of this color imbalance. And that's exactly why it's called a white balance, because these should all be balanced out. The red, green, and blue should be at the same level up here, and the same level down there, and the same level in the middle. Now there is a white balance selector where you can click on something white, but that's not the best way of doing a white balance. It's never gonna be right. Stick with your wheels here. So I'm gonna take care of this red in the highlight situation. So if I drag this away from red, it's gonna take red out of the highlights. So at first, I'm really just gonna be looking at the scopes and not even be looking at the picture while I'm making these adjustments. And then I'll take a look at the picture and see how it looks and see what it needs. So I'm gonna drag this away from red. You can see red is coming down. I'm gonna drag it until things are kind of lined up there. Red, green, blue. I'm gonna take this green on the shadows and get rid of that green in the shadows by dragging away from the green there. You could see they're starting to level out down there. Now I can see red is way down here. There's not enough red in the shadows. So I'm gonna kind of go up towards the red to put some more red in there and kind of balance this one out with these two. All right, now they're balanced. Over here, the red is still high up here, higher than the green and blue. So I need to take some more red out of the highlights. So drag that away from the red. Okay, now these are pretty level. And I look at the picture and it looks pretty good. The whites look white, the blacks look black. There's no colors in either one of them. Maybe a tiny bit more on the highlights, bring that up a little bit. So I'm gonna go turn this on and off and see the before and after. Off, on, off. Now that cast is gone and the picture has more contrast. Let's take a look at another clip. Uh, he's kind of dark. So if I wanted to make him lighter, I would deal with the midtones. So this is gonna keep the blacks black and the whites white, but it's gonna raise up kind of these midtone levels. So I'll raise up the global midtone levels. I'll hit undo, redo. So now you can see all these midtones much better. And then something else I'll do is I'll go up here and maybe add a little more saturation, 120, and possibly some sharpness. 
So just play around with it. So like here, it's 200 on the saturation. That might be the look you're going for, like a hyper real look. Before, after, before, after. So you can play around with this endlessly. I'm going to leave it at that. Do you want to say goodbye to Ladybird and DuPont? Ladybird, DuPont! Here they come. Sneak ready. Sneak. Oh, good dog. Goodbye.